miles a minute. Princess Elizabeth broke a speed record. The Hornby version of that train was in the shops within weeks, um, together with an endorsement of the driver. Driver Clark says it's fine. And it was that idea of authenticity and absolute detail and quality that was central to the whole endeavor. As the Hornby brand became a household name, the middle class were expanding into the suburbs and the Hornby model railway was the toy of choice. You see some of the sales literature for some of these houses. One of the interesting things is it often features boys and their dads and train sets. And this is the promotional material for the houses and the housing themselves. So it's this idea that, you know, this is a kind of lifestyle that you can buy into. You can become, become one of the people that can afford not just this house, but this kind of toy. Um, the trains themselves, of course, these housing estates are linked by these commuted lines and these branch lines. Dad goes to work on the train. It's only natural that his son would want to have a train set that, 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 ha that replicates that. The company realised there was a whole world out there to be modelled and reproduced every conceivable detail of the everyday world. The Hornby child would never run out of new things to buy. You weren't just buying the, the rolling stock and the track. You had all of the uh, paraphernalia to replicate the real world, uh, but to do it in, a, in an idealised way, to leave the, the grubbiness of the real world behind and create your branch line with the, the, the advertising, with the, the, the signs on the station, uh, with the figures. He was the, the rangy baggage porter, the businessman with his times, the milk churns waiting to be collected. You had that wonderful world, everything from the sleepy branch line station to the modern Art Deco uh, electric line terminus. Hornby provided everything needed to make a detailed railway scene. But for many modelers, their craft is about being able to show the world as they see it. I started to get involved doing buildings. Um, I didn't like the plastic buildings because they didn't represent what I wanted them to represent. I wanted funny things, I wanted strange things, I wanted sheds with roofs that had holes in and it's a little bit more difficult when you've got a ready-made or, or a kit ready to make. So I used to build, or I still do, build my buildings right from scratch. We are deep in rural Brittany in northwest France in the early 1960s. Maggie and her husband Gordon have made an award-winning layout of a small French provincial town. The layout is based on a small metre gauge railway in Brittany. Um, we've called it Penpool. The name is purely robbed from a small hamlet where there was a jeet we used to stay in. So it doesn't have any sort of bearing on a real railway or the, the real railway in the area. But the Réseau Breton, which was quite a sizeable system for a metre gauge railway um, in Brittany, um, offered us the opportunity to do something a little bit different. Even at this late date, there was still significant freight on the system, requiring the use of heavy locos, like Corpé Louvet Mallet number 41. We started work on it. We had to look at papers and pictures and maps and all sorts of things because we knew not a thing about this railway. Lots of the British railways we knew a little bit about or could find out about, but the French one, internet wasn't bad, but not that good. Um, and nothing was being built uh, commercially, so we knew it would have to be totally, totally hand-built. Everything you saw had to be hand-built. After 17 years of painstaking work, their vision was complete. Making it by hand was the only way to capture the essence of French small town life. It's that passion for detail that Gordon and Maggie find so attractive. You can build a square box as a building, put a roof on it, make it look beautiful, but somehow you don't feel like anybody could live in it because there's just something missing. And very often you can't even put your finger on it and then you change the colour scheme slightly, you put a dent in a front door, you break a window in model form, and suddenly it looks like it's been lived in. And I think that that is what 
we, we both try to achieve. Scratch builders, as they are known, like Gordon and Maggie, can choose the scale and size of their models. But interwar modelers had to get whatever would fit into their houses. Most trains were small enough for large suburban rooms, but still too big for many households. To make model railways more popular, they needed to be even smaller. The answer would come from the original pioneer of model railways himself, Bassett Loke. All these rich guys had these fabulous toys, and us oiks wanted our own. And I think that's what, you know, uh, Bassett Loke spotted. He spotted that he had to make it at a price, and at a size that would fit the, the modern two up and two down at that point. The future of the model railways, it was your loft and your bath. It was a seven, eight foot layout on a board, four mil. That's what he spotted. The Trix twin railway was half the size of his or Hornby's O-gauge trains. By his standards, it was relatively crude, but Trix twin was a sales sensation. Bassett Loke was as in touch with the public as ever. Hornby had to go back to the drawing board. Their answer was the new size double O gauge. They gave it a name to match, double O. It was Hornby's secret weapon, available in clockwork or electric. Hornby double O was um, probably one of the biggest things that happened in the reign of Hornby. Pictures famously have Dad with his pipe looking excitedly on at the panorama of Hornby double O trains. It went without saying that the grown-ups enjoyed it as well and indeed played with it as much as, if not more, than the children. Dublo was competitively priced and more realistic looking than the tricks. Hornby was back to being the nation's favorite. But in 1939, production was put on hold as Hornby turned to making munitions for the war effort. All those eager boys and eager dads would have to wait until 1947 for Hornby to go back into toy production. The effect of the Second World War on railways in Britain was even more dramatic than in the First World War. Uh, in the Second World War, the railways carried huge amounts of goods traffic, huge amounts of war materials, huge numbers of troops. The railways were worn out. They were bruised and battered, but the public loved the trains more than ever. At a time when there was little entertainment, children and teenagers discovered the joys of a new hobby. There's magic in numbers, train numbers. So think thousands of boys in every corner of the country. Loco spotting, as they call it, has become the number one hobby for schoolboys in recent years. And to be near Henry... After the Second World War, there was a, a, a huge upsurge in interest in railways amongst um, children and what we now call teenagers. And these were the, the train spotters that we all uh, know about and sometimes uh, laugh about because this was something that you could do very, very cheaply. You could buy yourself one of Ian Allen's little ABC spotter books, get a pencil, go down to the station, start ticking the numbers off. So a very cheap way of enjoying yourself of a Saturday afternoon. About 80,000 belong to the Loco Spotters Club, and with the cooperation of British Railways, they make trips each year along particularly interesting routes in their own specially hired trains. The train spotting craze fueled a surge of interest in model railways amongst the young. But those model railways were still only for some children. With the possible exception of maybe a building brock or a teddy bear or a doll, you can't think of a toy that is more um, representative of childhood than a toy train. And yet, of course, even when they were produced, and, and indeed now, they were always toys for a certain child. With electric sets, that child was invariably middle class. That was the preserve of, you know, one's wealthier acquaintances. The mother would invite you in. Oh, yes, do come in, Peter. Andrew is waiting for you in the living room, you know, and you'd go there and they'd be standing smugly by this big board with this huge piece of track on it. 
But early in the 1950s, one company, Triang Rovex, aimed their trains at working class wallets. Their new inexpensive sets brought the model railway to a mass market. It wasn't till the, till the 1950s when Triang Rovex came on the scene that um, you got these mass-produced plastic trains um, that were affordable for, for ordinary families. Uh, and it was a real process of democratisation for model railways. They were cheap. They were cruder. They certainly were not in the class of Hornby Dublo, but it was still a train set and it's still got as much love out of my house as any Hornby Dublo did. I mean, in the past, they'd used mostly die cast and uh, tin plate with Hornby, etc. And they found a way of producing um, uh, models using this very cheap plastic at the time, which warps with age and things. But it was a great step forward at then, and it meant they could produce a, a decent layout for a lot less than you would have done you know, with the, with the metal models. Now there was something available for everyone and model railways entered the golden age of Hornby Dublo and Trix Twin, Triang and Bassett Loke. Every child could have a train set to cherish. I saw the shape of the box and I thought, ooh, that's a Hornby Dublo train set. Bassett Loke uh, tin plate uh, clockwork set. For me it was a bright red and yellow Triang train set. Princess Elizabeth locomotive in green, British Railways green, and two uh, coaches to put behind it. Oh, I was thrilled to pieces. I, I mean, I had to take it up to bed with me and put it on the table beside the bed. I think I would have taken it into the bed. Well, I do remember it was a little red engine. I remember on top of the table, going round and round, I had hours and hours of fun with it. It wasn't quite what you'd think from the picture, but it was the start of, uh, you know, developing your own uh, railway and, and you used your imagination because uh, you, you didn't have much more, really. But just as model railways were hitting the peak of their popularity, there were clouds on the horizon for the real one. The railway landscape that modelers cherished, their source of inspiration, was under threat. Railway's enormous modernization scheme goes full steam ahead. The aim is to make British Railways the best in the world. Throughout the program, the technique is modernity itself. In the 1960s, the steam train was to be replaced by the brutal and far less romantic diesel engine. For the modeler, it was like a death in the family. It's at this time that the, the shift moves from uh, an emphasis on mainline running to an emphasis on cosy little branch lines set in the West Country with the odd piddling train um, tumbling along to, to some mine station. The emphasis shifts from celebrating the technological sublime to mourning the lost world of the, the, uh, um, the steam railway. The end of steam affected the baby boom modelers on a deeply personal level. Steam was intertwined with their childhood and modeling became about nostalgia for a lost age. When I was very small, when I was fractious, which was a lot of the time apparently, my mother would simply stick me in the pram, take me down to the side of the railway and park me and I'd be happy as a sandboy. And I guess that sort of started it. And, uh, you know, I spent a lot of time sitting at the side of railways. Because in, in those days, when we were growing up in the 30, 50s, greatest free show on earth. There was nothing on, there was no telly, there was no other entertainments. Well, we hadn't discovered them if there were. And there were all these wonderful machines tearing past at 90 miles an hour, very exciting. The excitement of speeding trains might be a common experience, but the inspiration to model is of a more personal nature. A lot of people, it is nostalgia. It's, it's a very strong driver. I mean, I model for myself. I model the, the British railways I knew in the 1950s, early 1960s, when I was growing up in East Anglia. And it's interesting if you look back, if you read historical model railway magazines, 